What would you do if you found out something you cherished was possessed? Would you try and throw it away? Destroy it? Maybe sell it to some unsuspecting buyer? And how did it become haunted in the first place? Those are the questions we're going to ask as we explore those very objects. Some you might be familiar with, others so obscure that they've been lost to the sands of time until now. I'm your host, Evan O'Hare. Welcome to Haunted Objects. So before you buy that trinket at a garage sale or accept that family inheritance, take a look at these haunted objects and decide for yourself if you believe. Thanks for watching Haunted Objects. Make sure to subscribe to our channel, like this video, and click the bell so you can be notified when new episodes of Haunted Objects goes live. Now back to the show. On tonight's show, we will explore the most sought after pieces of furniture ever to harbor an evil spirit, including the devil himself, and a trail of blood that will leave you wondering if these tales of death are real. A simple piece of furniture or a deceiving house to the most devilish of spirits. Everyone loves a gentle rock on a cool evening or whilst enjoying a, a good book or story. But what if your chair contains something with more sinister intent than simply soothing you beneath a blanket? The origin of this next object is unknown. The first mention of it is when it was obtained by the Glatzel family in the early 1950s. For the next 30 years, it was nothing more than a simple piece of furniture. That was until the summer of 1980, when the chair found itself the center of a tragedy that rocked the family. This sinister relic became a part of one of America's most notorious exorcisms, which involved an eventual murder. It is believed that the chair, quite literally, was cursed by the devil. The horror began in July 1980, when David Gletzel, 11, became possessed by a demon. One night, he woke up screaming, claiming that he had been visited by a man with big black eyes, a thin face, jagged teeth, pointed ears, horns, and hoofs. David was, everyone agreed, not the kind of kid who liked scary movies or who was likely to make things up. His older sister, Debbie, asked her fiance, Arnie Johnson, if he would stay with her family for a while and see whether it would help David get out of his depression. Arnie, of course, agreed, but things didn't get better. David reported more nightmares about the terrifying man who promised to take his soul. Worst of all, David began to claim that he was now seeing the beast while he was awake. He was always seen sitting in the family's rocking chair, which the beast now claimed as his own. David was the only one who saw the beast in the chair, but family members often saw it rocking back and forth, seemingly under its own power. The family first brought over a priest to bless this house. This didn't help. In fact, it made things worse. David's vision increased and he began to hiss at his family and speak with multiple voices. He started to quote from Paradise Lost, a book that most 11 year olds aren't exactly familiar with. Desperate for help, the Glatzels called paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren, who began making regular visits to their home bringing more priests with them each time and performing multiple exorcisms. After a final exorcism, the demon left David. He soon began to show signs of improvement. However, his sister's fiance, Arnie Johnson, was not so lucky. Apparently, the demon left David and entered him. He started making the same kind of growls and hisses that David had made as well as slipping into trances for a period of months before killing his landlord, Alan Bono, with a five-inch pocket knife. 
Bono died a few hours later in the hospital. And Johnson was picked up by the police two miles from the murder scene. Eight months later, Johnson appeared in court with the plan to enter a plea of not guilty due to demonic possession. For the first time in American legal history, demonic possession was used as a reason for murder. It didn't work. Judge Robert Callahan refused to accept the plea since there was no evidence to show that Johnson was possessed. Johnson eventually went to prison for his crime. He was found guilty of first degree manslaughter and received a 10 to 20 year sentence. Today, the Devil's Rocking Chair is on show at the Haunted Museum. Soon after it arrived, doors at the museum began shutting themselves and locking. Light switches physically turned off and it created a terrible tension between staff members in the area where the chair was stored. The exhibit was considered so destructive that it was closed by Zach Baggins. The final resting place of the chair remains to be seen and whether the exhibit will ever open again remains one of the biggest mysteries of all. Who knew a piece of furniture could be the center of possession and murder? Would you take the chance and kick up your feet and sit in this now infamous chair? If so, keep a lookout just in case it resurfaces on display. Whether the cursed objects shown this evening are of myth, urban legend, or fantastical paranormal occurrences is for you to decide. I hope I haven't left you eyeballing your shelves and contemplating your latest thrift shop purchase. But if I did, get in touch. Tell us about your possessed possession. And maybe we'll feature it right here on Haunted Objects. Thank you for listening to Haunted Objects, brought to you by Resurrection Films. Hosted by Evan O'Hare and produced by Shawnee Elise Cook. Directed and edited by Jason D. Morris. Written by Carly Street, Mark Francisco, and Jason D. Morris. Co-produced by Troy L. Foreman and Jason Hewlett. Executive produced by Resurrection Films and Berg Garabedian. Haunted Objects was originally aired on the Paranormal Network for Joe Blow Media Inc. <laughs>